I always feel like people come into your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And there's a purpose to it. There's always something that you can pull from that experience. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of the global ebook store Rakuten Kobo. We have a regular procession of authors who visit the Kobo offices. While they're here, I get a chance to learn a bit about their careers, creative process, and their reading and writing lives. And hopefully, you will too. Welcome to Kobo in Conversation. A number of years ago, Kobo started the Emerging Writers Prize with a fairly specific mandate. In the online bookselling world, Search rankings are based on previous sales. Recommendations are based on who's bought which book in the past and how they're like other books that you might buy. And in that world, there's one kind of author who was missing out. The first time author, the person who was bringing out their first book. Because what if you didn't have sales history? What if this was your first time out? then all of those sophisticated methods that we have for bringing great books to the surface don't have anything to grab onto. So we decided to start a prize specifically designed to help bring new books and new authors to the surface, giving them added light and oxygen so that they could burn just a little bit brighter. We also didn't want to have just a fiction prize and a nonfiction prize. Genre fiction, by which we mean science fiction, mystery and crime, fantasy, romance, paranormal, and all of their various combined hybrids are also something that a lot of Kobo readers read, but don't end up in a lot of literary prizes. So we decided that each year there would be three categories, fiction, nonfiction, and a rotating category of genre fiction. In 2019, the category was romance. At the same time, we took a look at how the book market was changing. People are often surprised when they learn that one in four of the books that we sell at Kobo don't come from a traditional publisher at all. They come directly from the author through our Kobo Writing Life program. They are self-published or independently published. Usually, those authors aren't allowed into major literary awards, and that was a fence that we wanted to push over so we made it possible for independent authors to submit their books for consideration to the Emerging Writers Prize as well. Those three decisions come together with today's guest. Julie Evelyn Joyce is a romance author. She is an independently published romance author, and she's the 2019 Kobo Emerging Writers Prize winner for romance. As with all of our guests, we'll talk about the books that influenced her growing up, the ones that shaped her as a writer, and the ones that she was reading or thinking about when she wrote her most recent work, Steeped in Love. Julie, welcome to Kobo and Conversation. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. This book opens with a dedication to your mother. Can you tell me about that? Of course, I would love to. I am sad to say that I, I lost my mother about three years ago, unexpectedly. And before my mom passed away, she was my biggest cheerleader in the world. And she always pushed me to write bigger, better, stronger things. I started out writing short stories and I never really thought I had a big book in me. And one day I set out to prove mom right and I started writing this big novel. About two months into the process, she ended up passing away and uh, of course it derailed me, but it never deterred me from finishing this book that was my passion now. If I couldn't share it with her, I could share it with the world. And so that's what I set out to do. And all the while I, I felt her pushing me on and cheering me on and saying, get this done, get this out in the world. This book needs to be read. And that's what kind of helped me to get through to the end. And this, with a bit of a sad genesis to it, this is a fun book. This oh, is a gosh, happy book. Yes. This yes. is yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. As a reader and a writer, those are the books I'm most drawn to. Books that just make you laugh, that make you, at the end, feel like you went through this amazing, wonderful, happy place, and you want to be friends with the characters, and you want to just relive it all over again. So that's what I really hope to achieve when I write a book. So tell us about Addie. Oh, Addie, <laughs> where to begin? <laughs> Addie is like many 
women and men out there who are just struggling to find their place in the world, but also to find someone to build a home with and find their person. She's struggled through online dating and matchmaking methods out the wazoo and finally one night just gets hit by this realization that all this time it's been right under her nose. Her great aunt who had passed away taught her how to read tea leaves and she's now living in the home that great aunt passed on to her and thinks all right what do I have to lose I'm gonna give it a shot and see how this works out for me and so going forward on every date she has a cup of tea and allows the leaves and the readings to kind of steer her along the way in selecting the ideal mate <laughs> and is the house that she's moved into the traditional giant beautiful rambling house of course. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it is demanding to be filled with children of and laughter course. and the perfect family. So, I mean, that's also weighing on her mind, of course. And she just wants to have that nuclear ideal family that everyone dreams of. And she realizes along the way that it's maybe not quite as easy as it seems to find that person. But she somehow realizes through the leaves and through her own heart and gut and everything combined that the man has sort of been under her nose all the time too. She lives in a small town. Yes. Tell me about the setting you wanted to put her in. <laughs> I grew up in a small town so it's natural for me to feel at home in a place like that and also to be able to create a realistic setting when I when I pull from my own memories. In this book and I guess I can steer us on to the first topic of, of books that influenced me. I was very much influenced by Lucy Mon Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables series and how that was set in such a small town where everybody knew everybody's business and, and yet everybody was rooting for Anne along the way, even though they were gossiping and there was jealousy and little things here and there that were happening behind the scenes, ultimately, Everybody just wanted her to, to reach her dreams and realize her happy ever after. So I feel like the same is also true with this town that I've created. And, and it also gives a little sense of welcoming and, and a feeling like, you know, this could be a town anywhere. This could be a town that I've been to or that I'd like to visit. And I, I also wanted it to feel like a place where you could find these quirky characters and you could find people who maybe don't fit the conventional big city type and everybody has a place everybody's welcome in a place like this and because this is romance if there is an addy there has to be at least one other person in the book tell us about ethan of course i would love to tell you about ethan ethan is kind of like the struggling novelist in all of us and <laughs> he's really struggling more than that to find his place and to find his way he hasn't had a lot of support on the writing front or in the in the choices that he makes so he ends up trying to find himself and leaving the city that he knew and leaving his family and finding this quaint little town and thinking maybe this is the place where i can find my voice as a writer but ultimately he's not really trying to find his voice he's trying to emulate all the other quote unquote successful writers out there who he thinks have it all right who, the great challenge of every author right yeah. exactly and he just tries to find his way into this popular mold instead of creating his own mold instead of telling the story he wants to write and listening to his own heart and following his gut. And meanwhile, as he's writing this, what he hopes to be the next great American novel, Addie has been having all her dates in the coffee shop where he sits in his corner and slaves over his computer all day. And he finds her conversations and her dates more stimulating than his own manuscript and he sits there and eavesdrops on all her failed dates and wonders what the heck is wrong with this woman and how she keeps rejecting bachelor after bachelor and what's all going on there. There's a, a very nice line about a quarter of the way into the book. Every relationship, even the failed ones, had a purpose. Yes. And it, is that a kind of a through line that you pull through the book? 
That's a line that's true to my own life. And I think it's something that I can really delve deeper into the book as well. But no matter how many dates someone goes on, no matter how many relationships a person has, I always feel like people come into your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And there's a purpose to it. There's always something that you can pull from that experience. And whether it be good or bad, whether it be fodder for your next book, <laughs> there's always something you can take away. And that's kind of how she uses the same mentality in the book. Like you said in the, in the beginning, it's, it's not meant to be any sort of negativity involved in this book at all. It's a very positive, inspiring, uplifting kind of book. So even the bad dates, there's something to be learned from them. And the good dates, of course, you'll keep exploring in that area and see what's really there. When did you know that being a writer was something you wanted to do? Oh, you know, I don't think I really knew until I saw a little TV show called Gilmore Girls. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and I have never been inspired to write until I saw this world that she created until I saw what dialogue could be, witty banter at its finest, and nothing has ever really motivated me in that sort of level until that show. And I was so driven to write that I think I was about in, on season two where I thought I need more people to be talking to me about this show. I need to find like other outlets and I went online and I found this forum that led me to something called fan fiction, which changed my life. <laughs> I immediately started writing fan fiction and I learned how to write through fan fiction and I started to build a fan base through fan fiction. I made friends through fan fiction and people taught me how to write and people celebrated writing. And it was really the best way for me to learn and, and also to learn that I wanted to do it and that I wanted to not just write stories based on someone else's reality. I wanted to write my own reality and create my own world, create my own characters. It just, it takes practice. And I knew, you know, I, I wasn't ready right out of the gate, but I was ready after I, I had enough practice in me. And for people that don't know the fan fiction world, it's huge, <laughs> like it is, and it's fantastically diverse and it's immensely interesting. <laughs> Which of the sites were you on? Like, where were you doing, spending your fan fiction time? Well, I first discovered fanfiction.net, mm -hmm. and that's primarily where I wrote all my fan fiction until later on, fans specifically of Gilmore Girls created their own separate site. It's of course no, they did. Of course. It's no longer in existence, sadly, but it almost became like the upper crust of fan fiction and they had a gatekeeper and only the best of the best could be approved and submitted on the site. So it, in a way it was nice because it kind of elevated. Sometimes you get people who just rush and, and want to put out anything and everything just to get some reviews and people then also take their time and, and months later have something they've created, which is upwards of 60 or 70,000 words, these immense stories that they put their blood, sweat and tears into just for the sake of sharing it with other fans of the show. And it's incredible. So they had a Taylor Dosey who was there ensuring, <laughs> ensuring community standards. Exactly. Excellent. <laughs> what books were most formative for you as a writer when you were deciding to start actually working on your own novel? Well, ultimately the two authors I'd say, well, there's three authors really. My critique partner and my dearest friend in the world, her name's Maggie Wells, and she and I actually started out in fan fiction together. And she blazed the trail and showed me that it was possible to not only write outside of that world, but to become published and to do so successfully and, and she has written dozens upon dozens of books now and has been with several publishers and has just taught me so much about the industry. I never would have had the guts to pursue that without her leading the way and kind of handing me the torch after. 
So thank you, Maggie. I love you. <laughs> and she's the greatest critique partner I could ever have asked for. So after I, I did decide to kind of dip my toes and see if I could get into that field, there were other authors, namely Kristen Higgins has been very inspiring in that regard. She's become a good friend of mine too. And she writes books that are the books that I want to write that are very emotion packed, but always with the humor and always with the, the real dose of reality in there. The characters are so lifelike and there's never a book of hers that I read where I think, gosh, I didn't connect with anybody. I never don't connect. I have deep, meaningful relationships with these characters. And at the end, you, you feel like I'm not ready for this to end. And so her work, even prior to me deciding to write, has been inspirational and, and something that I strive to create in my own writing. Uh, and then lastly, when I was really deep into writing Steeped in Love, it wasn't until maybe I was halfway through that I really started to see the influence of Sarah Addison Allen. She is a extraordinarily talented author who is able to infuse magic into her writing that you almost don't notice it feels so like natural just a little bit of magic. exactly and it feels so natural and right to that world that you feel like your own world has the same magic in it little things like there was a character of hers that she wrote that would always give something to another character let's say it was a spatula and the person would look at her and say well what do i need a spatula for and she'd say well you'll, you'll need it eventually she wouldn't know exactly why they needed it either but ultimately it would come in handy and there's another book where the wallpaper in a room changes to suit someone's mood and and it's just little hints and and snippets here excuse me here and there that have these bits of magic that you get so caught up in it and it's wonderful and so it made me think about my own book in that sense and how you have to suspend disbelief at times and really buy into the idea of these leaves having an influence over somebody of leaves in the bottom of a teacup actually looking like something other than a cluster of leaves <laughs> so you have to put yourself into that mind and imagine as, as she is something bigger than what it actually is and so i think when i think about the process i channeled the humor i channeled the bravery of my critique partner and i also channeled that little sense of magic that i could infuse in bits and pieces and with sarah addison allen what were specifically some of the books that really you know that kind of jumped out at you the Girl Who Chased the Moon is probably my ultimate favorite book of hers. And Garden Spells is another really big one for me. They're books that have really compelling characters that just you find a way of connecting to them that you never really thought possible. She writes characters young and old. She writes characters who have different traits and characteristics and, and physical abnormalities that might not fit in in your regular world but they're they fit perfectly into her world it actually makes me think of the greatest showman in some ways how he embraced these people who were different and found a way to celebrate them and i think that's kind of what she does in her books and and finds a way of celebrating the unique and the differences in people and you're not weird because you have this different ability you're impressive because you do you mentioned christian higgins Kristen, earlier yes, Kristen yeah. higgins. was there a specific series of hers that you really hook onto there is yes i love the blue heron series that was really the the group of books that pulled me into her writing and created this world that was so familiar that has these characters that really become more friends than characters young couples and young romance couples who are you know in their early 30s who by happenstance and circumstance end up together and the thing more than anything else about her writing like i mentioned is just that the humor that she adds to it scenes 
around the dinner table, scenes with multiple characters at once that I think she's kind of a master at creating these moments of tension and then releasing it with these scenes that kind of in, unfold into hilarity. And a huge amount of humor because she has oh, that gosh, yes, that yes, yes, romantic yes. comedy light touch yes, to it. Yes, yes. So there's a lot of that humor in there, but there's also a lot of real life stories and messages and her characters have a lot of depth. And I think that's something that has only evolved as she has as a writer. Uh, and now she's, she does more of a women's fiction theme in her writing, but she's never strayed away from adding that little dose of humor here and there, which is true to herself and her voice. Romance is a wide and rich category. How widely do you read across it? Because, you know, you've got everything from <laughs> kilts and historicals. You've got, you know, you've got cowboys and oil barons. You've got everything in between. Yes. And covering that whole spectrum is no small task. So where do you not. kind of, where do you fit within that? You know, I, I tend to stick to maybe three or four genres that I really find the most inspiring and the most enjoyable as a reader, but also that help me focus as a writer. Uh, so, of course, romantic comedies, because that's my jam. Um, <laughs> I, I love the contemporary romances. I do delve into historical rom romances, and I really am getting into the romantic suspense. And that's something that I think I'll probably dip into a little bit more as I grow as an author. It's still a little scary to me. <laughs> I tend to write where I'm most comfortable and because I, I know that I can, through my background and through the Gilmore Girls and through just my own personal life, I, I'm drawn to humor and I love to make people laugh and it just comes naturally. But the romantic suspense is something that keeps pulling at me and I, and I, I People like Sandra Brown, I'm just like, oh, I want to be you. Like, you're so cool. <laughs> um, so she and others like her in the genre are, and, and the thriller writers are very appealing to me. And I can definitely see me at some point going down that road. Um, but typically, yeah, I, I stick to the romantic comedy, the contemporary, and, you know, don't go too far either way. Your mom was a romance reader. She was, yes. And was she, was she a gateway in for you? <laughs> in many ways, yes, she was. She had her own little private collection she thought was hidden in her room. Of course, I found it. Of course. As all young girls will. And she tended to read stories by Danielle Steele and Judith McNaught and bigger names of the time. And while I did enjoy them they didn't really hit all the right notes with me and they weren't books that stuck with me until i found people like sandra brown and and mom always would laugh and and say how i would think i i discovered all these people and and she would say honey they've been around before you were born so you did not discover anybody but she thanks mom yeah. <laughs> She would celebrate the fact that I, I would be very interested in some of the same genres and the same books and the same authors and we'd be able to connect through those stories and we would fight over our shared book boyfriends and <laughs> have many conversations that evolved from little moments and passages in the books. Um, but yeah, that was something that was very special to me growing up is the love of reading that I developed from her and just being able to have those conversations and to this day we still have bookshelves lined with many of mom's books that we just don't have the heart to get rid of they're important and they're they're part of her history and it just means even more now to me to have those i remember when i discovered that my my grandmother my father's mother was a sort of semi-secret romance reader and they I think she only read them at the cottage, as far as I could tell. And so there were, we found this bookshelf. And they were all of those kind of lurid covers from the 1950s and 60s, <laughs> like teen juvenile delinquent. And it's like, Grandma! <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> so it's like, 
and that's I you know now I have a whole there's a whole inner <laughs> life there that I'm now uh, that I'm now like privy to that I was not before. You can't unsee or undo things. The damage has been done. <laughs> no, that's right. You published this book on your own. I did. It's worth taking a bit of time to talk about what's different when you do this all on your own as opposed to doing it with a traditional publisher. When a publisher takes you on, there's this whole mechanism that kicks into gear and there's sales and marketing and designers and editors. Mm -hmm. This you have to do yourself. Tell me a bit about that process. Well, of course, it's it's terrifying when you first look at it all in front of you. And I resisted for a very long time. <laughs> I, I just thought that it wasn't for me and that I was only meant to do traditional. And I think I was so stuck in that mind frame, partly because I was scared of the unknown. And I'm lucky in a lot of ways that that trail had been blazed long before I got here. If I had been one of the earlier ones, there's probably even less of a chance that I would have done it. But because there was such a wealth of knowledge there, I was able to connect with a lot of people who are very ready and willing to help. And I think that's another thing that really sets apart the indie community. They are incredibly eager to help new people. It's yeah. kind of wonderful in the it sense that, that there are so many people there who don't view it as a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, my helping you doesn't mean that I'm going to lose a sale or use no. a reader. It's we're doing this together. Exactly. And it's it's really a lovely thing. It's incredible. And, and so it was through one of my friends that I met at a conference, uh, an RWA conference. She, and explain RWA, oh, for, RWA second, for those who don't know. Sorry. It's Romance Writers of America. They do an annual conference each year and 2,500 romance writers gather together and we attend workshops and connect with each other, connect with other authors, agents, editors, publishers, the whole gamut. And it's a very staid and conservative event and no one has any fun no, at all. No, they're boring as heck. <laughs> I will never go back. <laughs> it is crazy town. It's crazy and It's so fantastic. Fun. It's so, so much fun. fun. Yes. And I met one of my dear friends at the very first one I attended. Uh, once she learned that I was planning on self-publishing this book, she basically gave me the Bible of how to self-publish a book in a Google Doc format that also scared me, but it was like a list of what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And it was a lifesaver for me. So outside of the main effort of writing the book, what did you find to be both the most interesting thing and the most challenging thing in that process? The most interesting thing I would say is just learning how easy it actually is once you put things in motion. And it's ultimately just creating vendor accounts, creating, in my case, I, I reinvented myself as an author. So I, I started publishing under my own name. And so I, I started to brand myself under that uh, new name minus my last name and just opening up these new channels it wasn't really that challenging but it was also interesting that i was able to find all that support and all these people ready to help in this community it was very much like finding my people and finding this group that couldn't wait to shower their knowledge on me and embrace me as one of their own so that was probably the most interesting is just learning how how community-based this group is. The most challenging was, I guess, just learning how to, well, I, okay, I would say <laughs> formatting, cover, and getting all the specifics right. These are things that you sort of take for granted when you're with a publisher because everything, like you said, is just handed yeah, to you. There are layout people, there are copy yeah. editors, there are, yeah. Yeah, and then when it's, when it's all on you, as cool as it is to have complete control, it's also daunting because you have the final say. And if your cover isn't really going to fly with other people, well, you just have to take the chance. If you like it, put it out there and go with it. The other challenge is that 
you're not necessarily on a deadline when you're doing this. And as a person who tends to goof off, <laughs> um, I need a little more stricter guidelines to adhere to. So I really had to push myself, but also took a lot of pushing on behalf of my critique partner, who's probably listening to this and nodding her head vigorously. Um, it, it takes a lot of people to, to encourage you to get to a point where you're like ready to let go of your baby. And with publishers, because of that timeline, they, they need things when they need them. And, and you know, you got to let go of it at some point. I was clinging so hard to that book and reading over it and over it and over it until I went cross-eyed because I didn't want anything to be off. I wanted everything to be perfect, as perfect as it could be. So that was the hardest part, I think, is to just like stick to stick to your guns, let it go when it needs to go, and trust that you've done the best that you can with it. Coming back to the cover for a second, <laughs> you made a great cover. Thank you. Where did the cover come from? Well, she's getting a lot of airtime today, but my critique partner, <laughs> Maggie Wells, actually made that for me. So behold the powers of Canva. Shout out to Canva there. Excellent. She was able to find through different online picture yep. vendors. She found the perfect image and found the, the font that kind of fit with the image. And all I told her was just a general idea of what I was looking for. She came up with this in like 10 minutes. And yeah. This is the friend every author I needs know. to have. I know. She's the best friend ever. And... So I've already hired her to do the second one and hired in quotations, but <laughs> she's very good at what she does and is just, she doesn't think too hard about it. She just kind of slaps things together. And, and if it was up to me, would exhaust myself going through every font and <laughs> trying, trying out like every color of the rainbow. And it would just be a mess of rainbow vomit on the page. And she just kind of... We've seen some of those books, by the way. They, <laughs> they show up. They, they make their way in here. She just tries to have like a very clear, clean look. And it fit the book perfectly. And I, I love it blown up. It looks so good blown up. So, yeah, I'm very happy with it. <laughs> Tell me about what it was like to win the Emerging Writers Prize. Oh, my gosh. The best day of my life? How do I sum that up? It was a dream come true. It, it was... Like, I wish I wish every author could feel what that felt like. It was a, a feeling of such triumph to everybody works so hard and puts so much onto the page, so much blood and sweat and tears and, and emotion. That book was about a two and a half year project and it was something that was especially meaningful to me because of my mom and because of the trauma that had gone on prior to publishing it. But to stand up there and to have this award given to me for something that I, I worked so hard on, that I put so much of my heart and soul and love into, it was like just such a, a tremendous gift to me. And it means so much to me as an author and, and towards my career and the very next day I just I had a, a list of things that I, I was ready to do that I could do with this gift that I wouldn't have done without it and you kind of you live in this world where, where you have to make decisions and cut corners where you can and, and make the choice of do I want to put money into marketing or do I want to hire this editor? What's the most important thing here? And that gave me the ability to say, I'm going to do both or I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that next. And it's just such a, a wonderful feeling to have that freedom and to have somebody recognizing you for your work and for something that you really are proud of and your dad was there and my dad <laughs> my dad still cheers when I walk into the room it's funny <laughs> he, he he and I pretty much like cried off and on that whole night and for days after and we are still so elated by all of it he was resisting coming because he's not really big on on socializing and <laughs> 
he is is a little bit socially awkward. And there's the drive into the big city. Right? Let's not yeah. you know, let's it's, not underestimate that. There's parking. Yes. There's traffic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but he has said over and over and over again how he's so, so glad and so thankful that he came with me that night. He was able to see that, and it was just a, a life-changing moment for both of us. And so being the winner of a, a first-time author award now means that it's time to work on book number two. Book two. I am already working on it. <laughs> And are we going to see something in a similar place? Are we going in a different direction? Where we, where are we going? We are very much in the same place. It's set in the same town again. Mm -hmm. um, this one's called Learning to Love, and it's set primarily in the school that is in this town. It's about teachers. Me being a teacher just kind of filtered its way in there. Source material, <laughs> always helpful. Yes. And it's interesting because my hero and heroine both come from very different backgrounds. She's been living in that town all her life and came from a very difficult childhood. They could barely make ends meet at times. And she's been teaching for over a decade and knows very well what goes on in that school. And they're not easy kids and it's a, it's a very challenging workplace. Um, and then this guy comes in who's lived a very privileged life, who was a big ad executive and marketing executive, and for various reasons decides to just go a full 180 and try the teaching thing on for size. Well, clearly they will never get together. Right? It's <laughs> destined for failure. <laughs> He comes in, Mr. Hotshot, arrogant, thinking, like, how hard can this be? I used to play football. I can teach phys ed. No problem. Well, lo and behold, he realizes that there's a lot more at stake here. The kids need a lot more than just some guy who thinks he's all that to walk in and be, become their best friend. They need someone to look up to and someone who inspires them and and it's very much, it's not just a story of these two different backgrounds and the, what they bring to the table. It's also a story of how these students kind of evolve along with them and the challenges of teaching and how you can kind of make it all mesh together in the end. But it's a really big time labor of love, this one too, because I'm putting a lot of my own personal experience into it and I'm infusing much of the same humor, but this one's got a little extra few layers of drama added on top of it. Well, we love series at Kobo. Series Yay. do very well. <laughs> so get that one done and then start working on yes. book number three. All right. Julie, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I have had a blast talking with you. Julie Evelyn Joyce's book, Steeped in Love, is published by the author through Kobo Writing Life and available at www.kobo.com. There is also an audiobook version of Steeped in Love in production that will be available from kobo.com. You can get links to the books mentioned in this episode and find previous episodes as well at www.kobo.com slash conversation. Be sure to give us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast source so people can find out how fantastic this is. And also check out our sibling podcast, especially relevant for our conversation today, Kobo Writing Life, all about the nuts and bolts of making it as an independent author. <laughs>